Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna be bouncing all over the place. We're gonna talk about some fun plants that are blooming here in the garden. We're gonna do a little bit of pruning. We're gonna do some of our, some of our planting, transplanting, all kinds of projects going on here in the Raleigh, North Carolina Zone 8A garden. So definitely uh, please follow along because this spring is gonna be just like this video, uh, bouncing all over the place with lots of information. The Miss Kim Lilac, uh, is almost in full bloom, not quite. I have to kind of film this thing because it's, you know, when we can and we're supposed to, it's raining right now. We're supposed to get heavy rain this afternoon. So I was worried that some of these open flowers might get damaged, but I, probably a day or two without anything severe weather-wise from it being completely open. This is a Korean lilac. I grew, no exaggeration, tens of thousands of these. I rooted every year and we, I sold in trade gallon containers to other nurseries to pot up into larger containers. This is kind of one of the lilacs that we can use here in the South pretty successfully. They're hardy in zone four to eight. They, um, you know, it's definitely not, it's not as long bloomed as French lilacs. It's not as, the flowers are obviously much, much smaller clusters. Uh, it's a much more compact shrub-like plant where some of those can get quite big over time, maybe six to eight feet by six to eight feet, something like that. We're in the process of limbing this one up. The one area where, that makes it better for the south, two areas that make it better for the south, one, it needs a little less, few less chill hours, you know, time spent below 45 degrees during the winter in order to, in order to flower well. And number two, it's much more mildew resistant. And once you get down here to the southeast, those of you familiar with growing lilacs, you know, they're, 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 very likely to get powdery mildew and down here it's so humid that it'll be much worse of a problem even still uh miss kim lilac needs to be in a little bit of where it can get some air movement on it because it's still susceptible somewhat to powdery mildew just less so than others it's pretty short bloomed but when it goes off it really goes off it's you know very very striking it's kind of the the, you know, the lilac for the, the lilac for the south, I would call it. We're in the process again of limbing this one up into a small tree. Uh, this one, the beauty of it is, is all the cutting that I've done on it over the last couple of years, it doesn't sucker, you know, like vulgaris does. I mean, if you, you do a lot of pruning on those, they can just kind of colonize pretty quickly. And this one tends to keep it, stay in the same footprint uh, without suckering all over the place. Uh, but be careful on pruning it. You can, after it finishes blooming, if I deadhead it, if I simply come in behind these flower clusters and cut them, that will allow for some branching and I will get more flowers next year by doing a very small amount of pruning. Because it will, again, it will branch and each of these end branches has three, four flower clusters on it, which is kind of interesting. Some have two and some have four uh, on the end of each. So by, by pruning it there, the branch will split into several and then I'll get additional flowers. They bloom on old wood, so do this right after they flower. General pruning, on the other hand, is not recommended with this plant, like really hard pruning. If you hard prune this plant, and we, we went in here and limbed it up and we cut it hard two years ago just to kind of get it into the basic shape that we wanted to get it into. And by doing that, we didn't get many flowers last year. And sometimes it can take two or three years to get back to its full flowering again. And I still don't think even now that I would consider this full flower for a Miss Kim Lilac. I think it's going to be next year before we uh, are kind of back to normal on it from that hard pruning. You can hard prune it. Just know that you're going to get many, many, many less flowers for a couple of years. It's a great plant and, and it's, you know, it's a great ornamental plant with, with or without flowers. After it finishes flowering, it has a great, you know, beautiful green foliage to it, not a lot of pest problems on it. Uh, and then it, it's, it's so hot here that we don't really get any fall color on it, but we'll get a burgundy kind of fall color on it if you're in cooler areas. But a lot of, we don't get as much great fall color on our plants here in the South that you get up in the North, you know, in cooler areas because the plants just get worked on so, so badly by humidity, leaf spot problems from that humidity and then overall heat that we just don't get great fall color. Occasionally we do on this or that, but for the most part, we're not thinking about fall color when we're planting things uh, down here in the South. But there you go, this is Miss Kim Lilac and we're gonna bounce around and do lots of uh, other things in the garden this morning. We're jumping in this week and starting on the foundation planting. 
there was a, uh, a sweet viburnum in this spot that was really, really large that I took out, put down on the street and gave away. And then there was a second one on the other side of the porch that we moved back. That was in last week's video. So that sweet viburnum is on one side of the porch. And then over here, we just planted this jubilation gardenia. This was a, a really, really compact gardenia that gets three to four feet by three to four feet, something like that. Typically, we'll see them bloom in mid-May here in the Raleigh area, but this one is completely budded up and right here mid-April. So just like everything else, everything's trying to be early. Our gardenias uh, in this area, number one, we're on the edge of where they're cold hardy. So we, uh, I typically will plant gardenias in slightly protected spaces, not like super protected spaces, but you know, up here near the house is probably a better idea for me. And then we'll mound them up just a bit as well. So they've been, it's just, it's planted up above the grade somewhat because they don't like our clay-based soils all that much. So gardenias, you know, I absolutely love them, but you do have to think through just a little bit how you're planting them. Uh, we've had good success in this garden, but again, we're mounding them up just a bit. Um, in areas where the soil drains a little better, it's not as big of a deal. Really love Jubilation Gardenia. We have the other ones from the Southern Living Plant Collection as well, but for some reason we didn't have Jubilation in the garden and it is just really super, super compact. Every time I see this thing in the container or in the ground or wherever, it's just a really nice, uh, really nice variety. Of course, you get the, the shiny, rich green foliage and then, you know, the, the flower buds, the flower buds come on them here They'll open up with double white flowers. Um, Scent Amazing has a single flower. Uh, Jubilation has the double flower. And then after it flowers, uh, you'll get a really nice uh, flush of growth that is kind of a, a slightly lighter green color that really contrasts well with the old part of the plant. If after they flower, you can do a little shearing on them if you need to get it under control. But this one grows kind of compact on its own. So we have one fragrant thing here on this side of the steps in the front, and then that sweet viburnum on the other is also fragrant. So we have two fragrant flowering plants with intent on the side of the porch. Behind me, is there's gonna be a conifer planted that will be probably in a second or third video this week, some other rearranging we're doing here. This uh, Charlie Boy quarter line was actually in the ground to store for the winter time. Uh, it was just a good place to put it uh, up here on the foundation. We planted several plants out in the garden just to get them out of containers, get them protected. They were better off in the ground. But this is actually going to be part of another project uh, somewhere, but this is a Charlie Boy Cordelon. It's coming out, it, it'll come out easy. It's only been in the ground three or four months. And then there's a, a, a Taxus Baccata down in front of the bed. That's gonna move further back into the bed. We always knew it was gonna get too big for the spot that it's in. It's slow growing, but eventually it's gonna outgrow that spot along the uh, entryway path. That's uh, Auro, Auro marginatus. You can see the uh, interesting new foliage on that, on that yew. Uh, really beautiful, that's a really beautiful plant, but we're gonna slide it back a little further in the bed so we can keep it in this bed longer into the future. Even then, it's going to outgrow. I saw Taxus baccata over in Germany that was, yeah, it's quite big, quite big, but I mean, on something like this, where we can buy it in a small container and we can get 10 or 15 years out of it without that becoming an issue, I, th I still think it's worth it sometimes to plant plants that we know will probably get a little big in the future, but it's a plant we really, really like. So uh, there you go. That's the start of this side of the step planting. If you follow along the rest of this week, we're going to be transplanting the things, rearranging the things in the bed and then adding a few things as well. Another plant that's going on the front foundation this week is this autumn moonstruck azalea. And I wanted to shoot it while it was still, while it was in flower. It actually has quite a few more flower buds now that I'm looking at it, but I wanted to make sure you saw it actually in flower. It's, pro it's pretty daggone floriferous uh, here in this uh, container. This is a beautiful one in this container. And what I'm gonna say is that every single one I've seen in a container has been beautiful. I haven't put one in the garden yet. I did an interview with Buddy Lee last year or the year before. I think it's almost been two years on this autumn moonstruck and then everybody's been looking for it ever since. There's finally some availability on it. And I know that plantsbymail.com has it available right now if you're interested. I have a plants by mail link down below the, uh, the video if you're interested in, in ordering, one, uh, ordering one from them. 
coolest thing about this, and the main reason I'm so excited about this azalea is because I've grown a bunch of variegated azaleas over the years when I had my, you know, I had nurserymen for over 20 years and all the variegated azaleas I ever tried had reversion in them or you could just see in the variegation that it was a lot of different types of variegations in it. And, you know, that tells, kind of tells me it's unstable. The original variegated abelia that were out on the market were that way. You could look at them and go, well, there's 14, which, which is, what is the plant that you're selling me? Because it seems like there's 14 different variegations in it for the different versions of the yellows and whites and greens in it. And now, you know, 20 some years later, we have Miss Lemon and Radiance and Suntastic Peach and Pink and all of these great, very stable, uh, very, very stable variegated uh, abelia. And the same thing here with this Encore Azalea. This thing, it's an incredibly stable variegation. Hasn't been any reversion in it ever. Buddy looked at it for years uh, to make sure that there wasn't gonna be any reversion in it, meaning you get green stems coming out on it. It's got a different growth habit than most azaleas. We think of azaleas as being low and doming. Every single one of these I've seen, this has been the growth habits that are slightly more upright. And it's a vigorous grower. I think you're gonna get this thing four or five feet in height in the garden and three feet wide, something like that. But that's the growth habit I've seen on it. The flowers start out as with a bit of a greenish hue and then get brighter and brighter white as time goes on. Of course, this is an encore azalea, so it's gonna repeat bloom in the fall. And just, you know, these, these white flowers shine against this variegated foliage. And then again, this is a plant that wouldn't need to flower. You know, I'll say that occasionally about some plants. This plant would never need to flower to be impressive. Uh, but I'm, anyway, excited about this plant. It's going on the front foundation out there and we'll get it in in the next week or so, but I wanted to show it while it still had some flowers on it, just in case I was going to uh, miss the flowers. This one's hardy in zone seven to 10. There are some of the Encore azaleas that are hardy in zone six. Um, this one is, uh, it, it's, you know, it's the plants that are mixed into the breeding that kind of decides, you know, how cold hardy they are. But this one is seven to 10, vigorous grower. I think it's gonna be incredibly popular because again, it's gonna look great 12 months out of the year in flower or not. with a combination of some head shears, some loppers, uh, extendable loppers at that, and a pole pruner. Uh, this, is a, this has a saw that also comes out on it as well that can be attached here, but the pole pruner has a, a, a rope on it where you can just slice off limbs. And I, because it has that little catch in there, I can stick it up here on the top, catch the limb that I'm trying to cut, and then pull it like that. That's a pretty easy way to cut tall limbs. Uh, I've, these pole pruners are one of those tools that will sit in your shop for nine months without getting used. And then the one day it'll be the most invaluable, <laughs> it'll be the most valuable tool in the entire, uh, in the entire shed. This lower pedalum, uh, first of all, it, it was a, uh, a Kmart clearance plant. If you can believe that, <laughs> this is a Carolina Midnight uh, Laura pedalum. It is absolutely full of pollen, and I just, I inhaled a lot of pollen. It rained a couple days ago, but it didn't rain enough to wash the pollen down out of the plant. So uh, if you're sensitive to a lot of pollen this time of year, you may want to wear some sort of mask if you're having to get in large shrubs and prune them because the pollen is definitely hiding in there. And so every time I, every time I hit a branch in here, I was inhaling more of it. This is a very fast growing Laura Petalum and this looks like a butcher job I probably did to it. Uh, I don't, this is one of those plants that can be finicky when you initially put them in the ground, but once they're rooted in and growing quick, uh, they become industrial. They go from one extreme to the other of, of kind of fragile to, oh my gosh, that thing is really aggressive. Uh, and, and this, well, this one, this is the second or third time I've pruned it in the last three years. Last year, we could not prune it 
because I started to do this and found a bird's nest in it and it was active and so I didn't get to prune it. So it really got very tall last year. It's squeezing the side of a couple of tea olives. The tea olives also need a little bit of pruning on the top of them. I'm gonna have to get a ladder uh, to do that. But this is just cut it and walk away kind of a job. It's not, it doesn't need any precision. We do want to try to get some light down into the bottom of it to make sure it's filling in down here though, because if, if I let this thing get 15 feet tall, it's gonna lose every limb down at the bottom and it's not gonna be full and we'll be able to see straight through the chain link fence that's behind it. So I've got to occasionally prune it down, angle the, angle the side back here just a little bit and allow some light to get in there and some new growth to start in the bottom in order to actually keep it full. Some of our screening plants, you know, <laughs> People, you know, folks will use things like Green Giant Arborvita or and Leyland Cypress less now, but more, more in the past. And those plants get 40 feet tall, but then they get very thin at the bottom and they don't become, they're not very good screening plants for where you're actually looking through them. Same thing with any of these large growing leafy shrubs as well. The same exact thing will happen. If you let them get so tall, they're going to shade the bottom of the plant and they're going to uh, end up thin at the bottom where you actually want the screen, right? Because this is where, this is the part that's important for the screen, not up there. Well, anyway, Laura Petalum is pruned. Um, I am, you know, I breathed in a half a pound of pollen, <laughs> but, but it is, it is pruned. I've got some, there's still a bunch of limbs up here in the top of it and all this has to be cleaned up. And then I'm going to get up here in the next week or two and prune these uh, osmanthus. This is another one. I can just flat top those osmanthus without any problem. They don't re really require any precision. If you are a nervous pruner, you can come and prune things, you know, at nodes uh, and places where you know they're gonna branch and make perfect little cuts. A little difficult though when a plant reaches 12, 14, 15 feet to be real precise. Um, but the beauty of leafy evergreens versus using conifers for screening plants is this is what I can do. I can come out here and take a third right off the top of it and it just grows back. Same thing with these uh, osmanthus, but with a conifer, it kind of takes away my options. You don't want to top, you don't want to cut the top out of m most conifers, but that's why I prefer leafy evergreens where we can, you know, for screening plants. Big limbs still laying up in here. Uh, there's a couple of branches I can still see, and once you get everything cleaned up and get, you, I can take a rake across the top of this and pull out any branches that are that I've cut that haven't fallen out, or you can just wait a couple days and they'll kind of show themselves because all the leaves will, you know, look very different on the ones you've cut off after a couple days and you can see where they are, but there'll be a couple little branches still to prune up here. This time of year in April, two things, we waited for this to bloom. This blooms on old growth. So we pruned it after it flowered. It flowered a couple weeks ago, uh, full flower and probably still has a residual one or two, but we're pruning it right at the end of flowering. So that's the appropriate timing. And then the other thing is I want to get this done as early as possible in the season because if I waited till June or July to cut this thing back like I just did, these leaves are going to burn. The leaves that are underneath those other leaves in, on a hot summer day uh, will scald the remaining leaves that are on here and the, the top leaves will just turn brown on it. So the fact that I'm getting it done in April or early May, as soon as it finishes flowering is ideal uh, to prevent that burn that would happen otherwise. Most of the plants we've been showing off in these kind of odd jobs uh, videos that we've been showing for the last few weeks, we've been just showing plants in peak flower, which is interesting, but there's also plants that can be shown off that are just because the growth, the, the foliage is so beautiful. This is a flowering plant and I'll talk about that in a minute, but when it's actively growing in the spring like this is unbelievable. This is spider's web fatsia. Uh, sp uh, these are marginally hardy so you know zone eight to eight to ten typically is what we're going to see when we look these up sometimes eight to nine uh, but they do fine in zone like 7b if you put them in a protected space and you spring plant them and that's kind of key because i didn't listen to my own advice on this plant if you've been following along with this project for a while you know i actually planted this in november three years ago and that's not the right time to be planting marginal plants because if they go right when they go in the ground if they immediately get hit by you know a freeze then that can be severely damaging luckily it was up here close to the house and it didn't get killed but it got knocked back severely it took a full year for it to really start to do anything again and just it just sat here and sat here last year it started to put on a little bit of growth and then look this spring it's finally settled in here and it's doubled in height and we're not even at our frost 
uh, average last frost date, which is, I think is tomorrow as I'm filming this. So it's unbelievable that it's already grown a foot and a half. Cool thing about this plant, this is a variegated fatsia. Uh, this one has a splotching on the leaves and every leaf almost looks like it's hand painted. They come out with this kind of chartreuse and white striping and then they'll settle into various shades of white speckling and solid green with white edges just really a wild collection and i think it partly depends on somewhat the sun amount of sun it's in this is definitely a part shade or shade plant but i think if it's in i think it's if it's in that area where it's just almost too much sun you know but it's not enough to burn them i think that's where they're whiter and whiter but th this is a pretty shady space in here so i don't get quite as much color in the foliage you know showing this off because the foliage is so beautiful but in the fall mid to late fall actually is when this flowers and it flowers with these alien clusters of flowers they're umbels they're perfect circles with little flowers on them that the pollinators absolutely go crazy for mostly honeybees but i'll see native bees on them as well and other flying creatures just absolutely love these and it'll form a little seed head. They're not invasive at all, uh, interestingly, uh, but it has this beautiful alien flowers and they're flowering at a time when almost nothing is. So there's lots of opportunity there for, for some of our late pollinators to take advantage of. But what an incredible plant and it's always doing something interesting. Again, you know, these marginal plants, I wanna emphasize this. If you're planting things that are barely already in your area, as you're watching this video in April or May, uh, this is the time of year to be putting these things in the ground so that they have a season to get adjusted before they go into that first winter. If I'd have spring planted this, if I'd have just held it in the container that November and spring planted it, it would have already been this big last year. Uh, ultimately, you know, I'll hold this somewhere in the five foot range. They can get bigger than that. I've seen them quite big. Uh, you know, Fatsia japonica is as big as 10 feet by 10 feet. But again, pretty easy to hold. Um, you, you could prune them coming out of winter into early spring would be the appropriate time to uh, prune them. Typically they've got kind of a cane like growth on them and you can just track those back into the plant and cut them off and still keep it looking kind of uniquely interesting without turning it into a meatball. So as you can see, we're bouncing all over the place. There's pruning to do because things have just finished flowering. There's a bed expansion that we had in the video last week where I put up the drone and did this uh, initial composting. And then as you're seeing from the drone here, we, I came in here and mulched and created these new annual borders. So the annual borders are moving in toward the middle and now there's a path through the middle. And then we jumped in and planted some annuals and this is uh, Steph's plan for the uh, <laughs> for the for the annual borders in the front garden so you, you want to go through the annuals that we've just planted yeah real quickly just to tell you a few of the things that we opted for the idea was to have sort of a cooler color clown college and we've done that so far we will have sort of a hot clown college as well in other places so don't be forlorn <laughs> <laughs> yeah right it'll still be showy it'll still be showy yeah and you find gonna, it from the moon yeah there's gonna have yeah. some oranges and yellows in other areas as well just wanted to show off sort of the color of the house honestly i just wanted to see what that would be like because it's all an exploration to see what what happened so the plants that um we opted for uh generally grow between i'd say 12 to 18 inches tall um, got a couple of um, gonfrina, just your classic white gonfrina, and then something called atomic purple. Might get a little bit taller with that atomic name. Uh, we've got a couple of salvias that are marginally hardy perennials. One's a little lighter periwinkle, and one's sort of a darker, richer periwinkle. Mixing in um, sort of a lavender colored angelonia and a white angelonia. Wanted to get a little whites in there as well. We've got um, Lavender Splash Kufia, 
That'll be great for the pollinators. Again, this the choices are also great pollinators, and we mm -hmm. always want to be a pollinator-friendly garden. We, we also have a rabbit issue. And so there's yes. a few of these things that are definitely, they're not going to eat the basil. They're probably not going to eat the salvias. Uh, there's a few things in here. They've never eaten the gonfrina that I remember. No. Okay. Yeah. So no, that, that, that's part marigolds. of the plan too. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Marigolds sure, they eat to the ground. Go marigold. Yeah. Um, but you let the cat out of the bag. Basil. I put some uh, opal basil in there mm -hmm. for a beautiful um, colored purple leaf. Uh, we initially at least won't really let it flower, but eventually we'll just let it go to flower and the pollinators love that as well. And oddly enough, there are some decorative eggplant. Well, it's actually, they it's a fruiting eggplant, but um, it's a Chinese string eggplant. The flowers are beautiful and there's, the pollinators love them. They're sort of a light lavender as well. So that and the really long purple uh, fruits are going to be just gorgeous, I think. So we'll see. I like to try new things, so we'll see how that goes. And I'm sure I've missed something else. Do let's see. Oh, how could I forget pink summer jewel salvia? The summer jewel salvia, which we use the summer jewel salvia every year. And we have that red one again. What's it yeah. called? We'll have in the garden red. as well. We yes, yeah, right. We we don't do a lot of red flowers, but that red summer jewel salvia was like it was it was a showstopper. Yeah. And for some, summer jewel salvia is usually not showy. But it's great for the pollinators, love it, but it's not showy. That red one is both. Yeah. I like both. the lavender too. Yeah. And they have some like corals and stuff. I really want to explore them a little more. So mm. anyway, um, we have a pink one, so that will be beautiful as well. What percentage of this is from seed that we did in the house? It's 50-50 maybe? No, this right here is probably 80%. So 80% of these we did in the house. So you can do the summer jewel salvia and the basil and the, the vast majority of it. Yeah, we'll, oddly okay. enough, the, the one that we did, the angelonia we bought, although we did some for seed, mm -hmm. and um, the lavender splash um, kufia, half of it's from seed and half of it we bought a four-pack too. Gotcha. Me not thinking, oh, I already have that. So that they're some of both in there. So hopefully it'll look beautiful. So th those are planted in compost and pine bark, which is my typical annual border, annual edge. The rest of this has a layer of compost and then the hardwood mulch over the top of it. There's gonna be a bench somewhere in here. We'll work that out over the next month and a half. There's gonna be additional plants going in this bed. The foundation has begun. There's a couple of plants that are kind of sad because we transplanted them and now it's gotten warm and dry quickly yeah and but this is a great view this is a you know we're i'm trying to introduce new line of sights during this season and i think this one is now pretty good now that the house is finished the foundation is painted the you know and all, all the tree forms are showing off this season this new annual border and all this i think this area looks pretty spiffy spiffy with yeah, spiffy, <laughs> but with a lot of with a lot of opportunity it's, it's spiffy but it has a, a lot of space for us to plant yeah we're pretty excited to have opportunity because we don't always have a whole lot of opportunity yeah. and we have great ideas for them so well, can't wait to share it and one last thing i'd say is the pansies don't have to come out because we move the annual borders forward normally we tear in our pansies out or planting around them to put in our annual beds we're going to be able to keep the pansies for as long as they're showing off. Uh, they're not as great as they would have been without rabbit issues, but the rabbits seem to, for whatever reason, leave them alone about now, and they're able to grow, or they're growing faster than the rabbits can eat them. <laughs> it's, it's one or the other. All of a sudden, it's the lilies they want to eat. <laughs> yes, right. Yes, yeah. So anyway, the, there we go, and we're jumping around. Again, you'll, this will be the first video, I think, of this week, and there's three more planned that we have a lot of stuff to put in the ground. So make sure you're following along. And also Steph has on the new ACA t-shirt and I have on the Conifer Collector t-shirt. If you're interested, they're over on the hortube.com website. Thanks for watching.